Welcome to Drinking Bros, presented by GhostBed.com. Welcome to Drinking Bros, kids. We've had a lot of accomplished guests on this show. Um, a lot of people with crazy, unbelievable life stories. Uh, Ryan Hendrickson is on the show today, and uh, you might take the cake, my man. Um, I, I mean, you're, you look, you've got a new book out called Tip of the Spear, and everybody is, is welcome to read about your life story here. Um, we want to thank you for your time today uh, and being on the show. Man, I, I appreciate you guys having me. This is awesome. No, nah, look, I, the, the honor is all ours. Um, Dan, why don't you share with the audience his life story? Because it's, it's, uh, it's kind of crazy. And then I'll ask you about what's real mm-hmm. or not real. I, I feel like this is one of those guys where you hear like the legend of this guy and people talk about it. But you're like, is it really true? And, and, and can that really happen in the military? <clears throat> yeah, I mean, well, he's proof that it can happen. But by it... Uh, my, my understanding is, and I haven't read the book yet, but I've read a lot of the reviews, and we've been following your story for a while now because it, I, I, I believe it's just you and one other helicopter pilot that have returned to spe- active special operations after suffering an injury like that, if I'm not mistaken. But um, <clears throat> basically deployed in, to Afghanistan, IED, uh, leg and foot fu- gets fucked up, mm-hmm. goes through the process, goes back to active duty. I mean, that's, that's a summary from my perspective, or not, from my understanding. Which is uh, you which know, never happens, by the way. I mean, it never happens in the regular army, much less in a high tempo special operations unit. So you can expand on that a little bit and tell us kind of like walk walk us through what happened. But first, start with how you got into the military in the first place, where you came from, and shit like that, so people know who you are. Oh man, okay. So this is uh, this is gonna be a wild ride here. Uh-oh. So um, so in uh, I I grew up in a little town in uh, Lowell, Oregon, and uh, basically turned uh, turned eighteen. My dad said you know if you don't leave now you're you're never going to leave this town you're going to just be that guy so uh um basically uh military they that was my option college was not and uh <laughs> and uh marine corps at the time they uh i don't know they just didn't no branch really needed anybody in the mid 90s except for the navy right and so uh, the recruiter you know the navy recruiter comes up and you know he's hey you want to you want to be a F-14 Tomcat pilot like Tom Cruise? I'm like, yeah. <laughs> so you want to be a Navy SEAL like Charlie Sheen? Uh-huh. <laughs> you want to go to, you know, exotic ports and see exotic women? I was like, yeah. He goes, cool, man, sign here. Well, the exotic port thing happened, but, uh, yeah, I was. I never flew an F-14 <laughs> nor a Navy SEAL. But um, Well, look, on the yeah. flip side, you didn't get AIDS like Charlie Sheen, so That's you know, true. you're ahead of <laughs> – you're ahead of the curve on that yeah, one. Yeah, and I'm not sure yeah, what the Navy's uh, recruiting procedures are, so, but at any point, did any of the Navy recruiters like kiss you gently on the back of the neck or anything like that, or how does that go? I haven't, I've never been in the Navy, <laughs> so I don't know how it goes. I'm, I'm not entirely sure. There's, there's a chance that it happened, but you know, <laughs> you know influential 18 year old kid. So, um, did four years in the Navy, then got out for a few years, traveled around, and then uh, came back in, joined the Air Force. And uh, did five years in the Air Force as an ammo troop, and uh, then I did, I did this program from the Air Force that will let you directly switch over to the Army. Yeah, blue to green uh, or some blue shit. Green like, program. Yeah, yeah. And cool. uh, and yeah, I switched or changed it over to the Army. Uh, went to Benning for infantry. SF recruiters said, "Yeah, you're uh, you're going to go the do the 18 X-ray program." It's like, I have no idea what that is. Sounds really cool. And, uh, and then the rest, you know, Q course, graduate seventh group. How long were you mm-hmm. overseas before the injury happened? So I actually, my first deployment in seventh group, um, I was overseas six months and then I stepped on that IED. My God. And, and that it, was what, 2010, right? Yeah. September. We, uh, we had kicked off the mission September 11th. And then the early morning of September 12th is when I hit the IED outside a compound. Oh, shit. That's a week before I signed out on terminal, actually. The next week I was out wow. of the Army permanently. Really? Yep. Um, so when the IED <clears throat> goes off, uh, did it take off your leg and foot? It was so it, it was kind of crazy. Um, when, when the initial explosion happened, I, I couldn't I, I didn't really know what was happening. 
Um, I didn't know if the guy in front of me stepped on it or whatnot, but I knew I couldn't breathe because all the ammonia and dust and mm -hmm. everything. So I kept trying to stand up, um, find my M4, kept trying to stand up and, and get to where I could breathe because I thought I was going to suffocate. And uh, I, I couldn't move, and, was, and it still didn't hurt. And I was, man, what, what in the fuck is going on? I'm getting mad at this point. And, um, and then as the dust starts to clear a little bit, I look down, and, and my, my leg, my boot is about six inches off my leg, and um, it's kind of at a 90-degree angle from, you know, so your leg goes straight down, and it was at a 90-degree angle. And I remember thinking, I, I was like, I, I don't remember taking my boot off. So how is this possible? Because it still didn't kick in. It's kind of kind of not really a natural thing to step on an IED and have your limb flopping on your head. Right. Sure. But yeah, I, I raised my leg up and boot flopped over and I saw my tib and my fib sticking out. And then it's like, oh, yeah, now, yeah, okay, this is bad. Uh, and, and what happens to you at that point? Um is the, does the pain immediately set in? Or are you in so much shock that you still can't feel it? Because we've had other guys on the show who have gotten blown up, and uh, they have different versions of uh, what happened to them. Um, what happened when you looked down and realized what, what, what was actually going on? So when I looked down and actually realized what was going on, it, it took me a minute until mm -hmm. I actually saw my bones sticking out. And mm -hmm. then I could see, like, the blood wasn't squirting or anything like that. It was just oozing. And um, then the pain started to kick in. But it didn't, it didn't happen all at once. Be, I, and I, I guess the best way that I could recall it is as I started to figure out what had happened, the pain got more and more and more until, until the dust is clear. And then, you know, the commotion sets in of your team trying to get to you. But I had walk, walked into an IED field of you know, a, a mind area. And so they couldn't immediately get to me. And that's when it was like, oh man, I, I, I could die here today. And it was, uh, <laughs> it was kind of crazy, but yeah, the, the pain, it was, it, yeah, it, I, I don't even know how to explain it. It was intense. I, I'm sure. Um, did they end up having to amputate it all? So what had happened throughout the process was, we um after i got hit uh the taliban you know they were on icom chatter cheering and uh, cheering and everything like that so but they were talking about hey we need to we need to put in the ambush form so the guys had to quickly you know tourniquet ace wrap and we had to move out well because of all the infection and everything like that and the debridement and whatnot that i went through i think it was a good week and a half in afghanistan before they could stabilize me to fly to uh, germany Mm -hmm. But uh, they had kept my limbs together, and I think, and they had all the wound vax on it and everything like that. Um, and so I think the reasoning behind that was is the infections and stuff like that got me to Germany, and they just they put a couple rods basically sticking outside my leg and then drilled holes into below my tib and above my tib and just uh, banished me up for the uh, trip back to Bamsey, Brooks Army Medical Center. And um, when I got there, they, you know, there was 2010 was a good, like, exploratory, surgical exploratory year as far as, like, lots of dudes were getting tore up. And um, so they had, they had told me about this limb salvage program. And it was basically, they said, hey, um, any bone damage, we can replace bone. What we can't replace is tissue. Mm -hmm. And the uh, IED that I'd stepped on was very, very high quality HME. So it was kind of like C4. You got your, you have your um, TNT or your dynamite, which is a, it's a pushing RE factor. It's a pusher <clears throat> and C4 is more of a cutter. Well, the HME, I, I, or the IED I stepped on, it cut right up through my heel and then blew out almost at a T at my calf. And so they said, Hey, um, we haven't had a leg like yours before and we want to try and reattach your limb. Um, this, you know, if it's successful, uh, it could, it'll help out with, um, with limb, limb salvage and limb reattachment, um, uh, technology. And if it's not, what do you have to lose? You, you know, you aren't going to have a limb anyways. And, it, so, and is this surgery taking place in Germany? 
No, it all waited till I got to BAMC, Brooks okay. Army Medical Center. Okay. Um, and, and were they able to successfully reattach it? And in in, are you able to walk on it now? Yeah, so I, uh, I was given, a, I, was given I, I remember it was like a 13 to 15% chance that it would take. And um, my, the skin graft on the bottom of my foot and the skin grafts all around my leg, they all took the very first time, um, which is unheard of because of infection. Uh, I never got a bone infection and I was able to grow back three inches of tibula in about nine months. Wait, you can, so, re yeah, I, your I, bone regrew? The, they didn't yeah. put like an insert or anything. It's like your bone actually regrew. Yep. Holy yeah, shit. I didn't even know that was a thing. That's amazing. How, I didn't either. Yeah. Wow. How it works is, so they have this thing called a um, X fix on it. It looks mm -hmm. like a giant bird cage. Um, the recent person to go through it was Alex Smith, the quarterback. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, um, and Dak Prescott's going to end up having a bird cage on also. Yeah, you know, shit. it's funny you said that. I, that was going to be my next question actually, because what it sounds like is what, was very similar to what we saw in the game on Sunday yeah. with Dak Prescott. And, uh, yep. yeah. Um, uh, yeah. I, again, the, the reason why at the top of the show, I said like the, the legend of you and the, the crazy stories behind you, you're a guy that has been tagged and, and people have messaged just a million times about having you on the show. Cause there are stories that Oh, he got his leg amputated and now he's, uh, you know, he's, he's using a prosthetic and he's back or whatever, but you're, you're, you're what you're saying is, you're using your actual real leg still. Like that is 100% mm -hmm. yours. Um, and you were able to go back after that surgery. Yeah. That's, yeah, that's that is, I mean, that is pure insanity. Yeah, that's wild. What, so what, how yeah, much, I, what would you say <laughs> if it was a percentage? Like what's the functionality now versus before? Yeah. So I, so I do wear an Ideal brace. Um, it's a intrepid something really, really uh, large medical word that, uh, <laughs> but anyways, it, it gives me a calf and it gives me basically the, my foot. And so I, I still have my, my leg and I have my foot and you know, it's all, it's all skin graft, um, which is kind of cool because the bottom of my foot is actually skin off my ass. So I, I want to kick someone in the face and you know, it's like, yeah, you just got ass kicked, but, <laughs> it, uh, but it, uh, but yeah, I wear an Ideo and, and basically uh, my, my leg, I would say um, there, there's a lot of nerve damage. There's probably three quarters of it. I can't feel, um, I can't move my ankle at all. It's, it's, it's completely just an L um, down there. But with that Ideo brace on it, it brings me up to like 60 or now nah, I'd say about 75%. And without it, I'm, I'm probably hauling around about 40%. That's great. Mm. Yeah, because we, we've had a lot of guys on the <clears throat> show who have gone through, you know, similar uh, IED explosions and things like that. Um, and they're, usually their first comment was, man, I just wanted to go back. You're mm. one of what two people, like Dan said at the top, who's actually been able to go back. Was that part of the motivating factor in your rehabilitation? Um, I, I, so there's a couple motivating factors of it. Um, one of it was I, I could hear the Taliban cheering. Um, when I got hit and, uh, and so that, that, you know, I, was, I, I didn't want the Taliban to beat me. You're not, you're not going to be better than me. You know? Yeah. You, you bloodied me up a little bit, but you know, watch this. I'll be back. Mm. The second was, um, I started heading down a real dark path and, uh, my dad, my dad had told me, you know, early on, he's like, Hey, um, you know, I, I know what you're going through. And he said, it looks like you got two choices. He said, um, the first choice is you, you can become a victim of your injury. You can let this injury um, control you, take you over. You'll always be, you know, the guy who was wounded in Afghanistan and you'll never move past that day, September 12th. Um, and, and who's going to blame you? No one's going to blame you for it, but it's a lonely, lonely road and it's a dangerous path to be on. He said, or you can use this injury to make yourself a better man, a stronger man. You can use this injury as as a as a um you know you you get a reset at life and as you're looking back at your life right now with all the i wish i would have or or man i should have done this different or this different he said you you have a chance that many people don't get and you get a do-over you can actually do that stuff that you're laying in bed right now and they're and it's agonizing you and he said yeah it it sucks and it's dark but 
He said, it's up to you. I just highly recommend you don't go down the victim role because uh, you, you, you may not recover from it. Right. I mean, that's a trap that a lot of dudes fall into, uh, regardless of mm-hmm. what the injury or, or situation is. Now, you, when did you return back to active service and how did that go? Did you return back as an operator? Were you do, did they make you like a, uh, an intel guy or like how did that work exactly? Did you just jump right back in the line? <laughs> so, so when I, um, when I was released from Brooks Army Medical Center, I went back to seventh group in November of 11. Mm-hmm. And I got back there and Wait, we were gearing within, up to within do a year? Within a year? That's a, a year later? Uh, yeah, I was um, year and two September months. I got blown up and I was released November of 2011. Mm-hmm. Man, that is some gangster ass shit. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> yeah, I just I da- pounded the crap out of my leg. The harder you work, the more bone you grow quicker. Oh, really? Shit. So, so Dak. Wow. Uh, Dak. Dak will be back in action. It's then. four to six months for that. Injury. Yeah. Yeah. But I guarantee I guarantee you he will. I, I guarantee oh, yeah. you, he's probably going to have the guy that that uh, my physical therapist, because my guy worked with Alex Smith. Mm. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Um, that's amazing. So, I mean, that is a 14 month turnaround, essentially. And you're back in. Um, did yeah, did was, everybody know it, it, what you had gone through? Like when you when you uh, got back, you know, 14 months later. So so I ran into a lot of that. And, um, one of the, one of the things that crushed me. So when I got back, um, in November, I was non-deployable and they were going to, I was going to ride a desk, you know, be on the B team or work at the air cell or something like that. I was, a, I had a permanent dead man's profile for the army, non-deployable, everything like that. And, uh, when I got back, I remember the, um, I, I, I was told a couple of times, well, hey, you, you still got your legs. So, I mean, it wasn't that bad. Like, man, you, you don't know what I went through. And that, that <laughs> used to crush me uh, because I, I would I, I almost, you know, I, I'd go in and out of, you know, kind of like a little bit of depression and whatnot. But I just remember thinking like, man, I'd be so much better off if I didn't have a leg because people don't understand. Like when I landed and I looked down after the dust cleared, my leg was not on my body. The right, casualty yeah. feeder card <laughs> says below the knee amputee. And, um, and so, yeah, it, it, it bothered me, but, um, I got into this, uh, into the Thor program, which, which is our return to fight program at seventh group. A lot, every base has one. Mm. And I just, and I, my goal was to just, just pound the crap out of myself to prove that I was still an asset and I could still be on a team. Well, the company had deployed, and I had a, I had a promise from our battalion sergeant major, who that uh who was transitioning over to group sergeant major, that if I got medically cleared, he would send me back to combat. And this was all the way back when I first got blown up, and so I went through the Thor three program, and I was I I was chewing dudes up that were you know that weren't injured, and so I got cleared, and by then the company was in Afghanistan. Well, the uh the group surgeon. He signed off on the waiver that overrode um, Big Army's non-deployable status. Seventh Group took resp- or took a responsibility, and I was on a uh, I was on a flight, you know, <laughs> to Afghanistan in March 2012, and uh, there were some surprised people when I got there. I'll put it that way. Did you get <clears throat> to kill the Taliban? Yes. Ah, there it is. There's the answer. <laughs> There's the answer. Um, for us dummy civilians out there who are, who are listening to the show, when you could hear them cheer, were they on a mountain or was that through a radio? Like, how do you get to hear uh, them celebrate what they're, what they're ultimately trying to do is, is, is kill you guys? Yeah, so they, we heard them over ICOM, and that's their radio system that they communicate on. But we call it ICOM Chatter. And, um, and so whenever they get a strike or whatnot, they'll come up on ICOM and start, you know, like, Hey, we got one of the Americans or, <clears throat> or their math is amazing. We killed 500 Americans yeah. and, you know, yeah. start moving the ambush into place and all this stuff. And, and so, yeah, I could hear them, but when I hit the IED and my team got there, they were doing a little celebration about it. And it, it, it kind of, yeah, I'll, I'll never forget that. <laughs> Yeah, I that's bet. kind of their that's their TTP over there. They try to uh, inflict a uh, small level two mass casualty events locally, and then try to box you in and ambush with a coordinated complex attack. After that, meaning like 
RPGs, small mm-hmm. arms, and belt-fed machine guns and shit like that. It's yep. pretty. That's like the most. That's why Kazakh and Afghanistan is so goddamn important. Like you cannot get pinned down there, and particularly not and and anywhere near any of the passes, because they will fucking come down on you from those mountaintops and fuck your shit up. Like that's a you don't want to be in a kill box. I right. think just saying the phrase "kill box" out loud tells you you don't want to be there. Yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Um, no, so, don't. so how many deployments did you end up doing after the injury? Um, I just returned home from my seventh overall, so six more deployments after my injury. Holy to Afghanistan. shit. Including your contractor time? Uh, one contractor and five active duty, yeah. Damn. Wow. I, that's, that's crazy, man. I, again, people have messaged us about you for a long time and yeah. i said hey let's wait until you got something cool to promote and you have this book out um what made you decide to write a book about your experience because this is one of those things where every i think everybody wants to write a book it is a very mm-hmm. long and difficult process what made you personally want to write this book so it actually it actually didn't start off as a book funny enough i um so I, I was having some, you know, some issues with, uh, you know, anger and whatnot like that. And, um, I'd gone to counseling and I remember the guy I was looking at the dude and he was just, he was very structured. And I remember he was just going down the list and I remember saying, what's my name? And I saw his eyes look up to the top right hand corner to see what my name was. And I was like, all right, we're fucking done, dude. <laughs> so I walked out. And so I, um, I was talking to our chaplain quite a bit. And I remember one of the things that I was always, you know, talking about was like, we could sit here, us three, and we can go over war stories and what bothers me and what bothers you and everything like that. And then when, when we leave, we go home, we go back to families and feed the dogs and put <clears> gas <throat> in the car. All of it's dead air. It's just gone. And so he had said, well, why don't you try writing? I was like, yeah. I ma- I majored in English in the third grade, but that's really it. <laughs> and, so, and so I was like, I, so 2007, so I was in Afghanistan in 2016 and we, uh, we, we ended, we were on a mission that, you know, we had, uh, roughly about 12, uh, Afghan KIA, four Americans, WIA, um, 18 Afghan WIA. It was bad, bad mission. And so coming back from that, um, I, w- I was starting to just really just wanting to put all this stuff, like somehow just get it off my chest. Mm-hmm. And so I was in Afghanistan for 16 and then I returned in 17. And um, that trip, I just started, just started typing, just word document and typing and it just started flowing out. And so it was kind of therapy for me. And then I went back to Afghanistan in 2018 and um I, I, I kind of started to organize everything with the way that my brain worked. And I had a couple of buddies read it and, you know, I mean, group guys, well, military guys in general, they're, they're, they tear each other shreds. Mm. It's just the way that's how, you know, they love you. Um, that's the difference between civilians and military is civilians will talk shit behind your back, but be nice to your face. Mm. We'll talk shit to your face, but we're nice behind your back. Yeah. Um, it's weird. And it's very bizarre. Like you'll, uh, uh, we, Bert Kuntz will say this shit all the time. He goes, I would never say this in front of him, but this guy's super nice. Like, why would you not say that to him? <laughs> you, saw, you saw him a bitch, but that's, we're just assholes. I mean, that you got, if, yeah. a, if a guy is ignoring you, then that's how you know he doesn't like you. Yeah, if, he's, right, right. if he's calling you a piece of shit, yeah. then you like that. All right, we're friends, I guess. <laughs> it's so stupid, but it is what it is. What but I, um, yeah, but 18, I just started organizing it and stuff. And I had a couple like real close buddies and they were like, yeah, man, I'll, I'll read it. And I, I know it's going to get, it's going to get shredded. And they came back and they're like, dude, you, you need to do something with this. So, you know, after that I had some family and said the same thing. And so, you know, I, uh, did the whole online, how do you do a book thing? And I got, I got, uh, you know, scammed for five grand until finally someone was like, just look up military authors and mm. email on them. And if they reply, just ask them. And finally, a lady uh, named Lynn Vincent, who did, uh, she's the author of Dog Company hmm. um, about Wardak Afghanistan. Mm-hmm. And she, uh, she mailed me back and got me in touch with, um, with an editor, Mike Yorkey, and uh, him and I, we just went back and forth until it was ready to go to the DOD. 
and then DOD review, and then it got picked up by Center Street Publishing, and now it's uh, now it's out there. That's and amazing. That's how, uh, yeah. how how long was your DOD process? Just out of curiosity for yeah, that book, I was going to ask the same. That that was little under a year. I want to say ten months, and like oh, it's not that bad. Fuck you, dude. Um, ours was seventeen <laughs> months. Uh, seventeen months, but it had to go to the agency too. Well, the agency cleared in, in under 30 days. Yeah, that's true. So uh, that was amazing. But the DOD did not. And we ended up having to get a lawyer involved. And because uh, it's a nasty process like that. I as a civilian, I really got to learn about what you guys bitch about, like the military and their uh, paperwork and their processing time. And it is not fast yeah. whatsoever, nor do they give a shit. And you guys are severely understaffed. There was one woman who was reading all these fucking books. And when we turned ours in. Yep. It was like, hey, how many are in the queue? 27. Great. When will I get that back? Six <laughs> to eight months. Not a prayer. <clears throat> Not a prayer. Yeah, she, um, yeah, it went from her, had to go to SOCOM, then to CENTAM and, <laughs> and everything like that. But yeah it, was, yeah, it was almost 11 months and it came back and the pictures were approved and I, need, I didn't need to redact anything. It was good to go. They wow. just, That's well, good. No, I had to redact one thing. Um, they were like, don't. Don't use your ex-wife's name, man. That's, you don't <laughs> want to go down that rabbit hole. <laughs> we got the but, same. Yeah. We got the same <laughs> notes on an ex-girlfriend. They were like, "Hey, man, you want to take that?" I was like, "Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll take that." By the way, yeah. this super funny. Center uh, Street is kind of a powerhouse in the in the. I don't, I don't know what you would call it, but they have a David Baldacci. They do all his shit. Mm -hmm. uh, they they publish Malala Yousafzai's book. Like, yeah, they, there's a ton of good fucking authors over here. Yeah, no, nah, look, it's, it's great. And like, you know, Michael Conley for the people at home, I think the other important thing about this is because Dan and I get this question all the time of like, hey, man, I have these crazy war stories and I think my book would be amazing or whatever. Very few people actually take the time like you did to sit down and write it out because it's hard. Mm -hmm. Like you were saying earlier, like uh, that writing might be therapeutic. It is, but it also forces you to relive all the bad shit that happened to you. Um, yeah. What was it like going through that again, going through that process again? Believe it or not. So the, the military stuff wasn't as bad as the childhood stuff, mm. you know, reliving, you know, kind of, kind of the, uh, you know, some of the stuff that um, happened to me, you know, when I was, when I was younger and uh, you know, being an eight year old kid growing up way too fast, it's, that's not a, it's not a good thing. But um, what was way too yeah, fast so, about it? If you don't mind me asking, and yeah, I hope so I'm not intruding my with dad, that question. He, my dad used to be a, a logger, uh -huh. um, and so he would leave on logging trips, and um, I would always stay with his wife at the time. And I, I can't I can't name names, but mm, um, obviously, yeah, yeah. But yeah, her and her roommate, they uh, yeah, I, was, I grew up real quick at 18 years old, so I was sexually uh, molested and whatnot. So so kind of kind of set the uh kind of set the stage for a lot of issues i had growing up if you can imagine that you mm -hmm. know um just with the trust issues and everything like that but um in the end i just you know there's always someone that's had it worse and and there's mm -hmm. bad people everywhere and it's once you once you quit becoming a victim of it and and just understand hey man shit happens and and yeah that's bad but um, the, it, it's the victim mindset. And I believe our country, a lot of our country is stuck in it. Well, poor me because I grew up like this or poor me because this happened to me, or you owe me this because of this or this or this. And it's a victimization mindset, but people don't realize like you're not owed shit and congratulations, man, you're a human being, but you know, quit thinking you're des you deserve something that, that nobody else does, or you're entitled to this, or you're special because of this. You're not, it's, you know, get over yourself. And so once I realized that and I start and I, and I was like, Hey man, you need to quit feeling sorry for yourself. Bad stuff happens. Mm -hmm. And, um, I educated myself. I, 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 I've seen, I've seen, well not seen, but I've read about some really like some nasty stuff that humans do to each other. And I was just like, all right, man, you need to quit, quit, quit becoming, a, quit making yourself the victim here and get over it. Right. And, that's kind of how I did it. Yeah, we talk about that all the time. I, it's one of the reasons, like, I don't necessarily believe, I certainly don't believe in compulsory military service because we don't, as someone who's served in an uh, infantry unit, I don't want people there who don't want to be there, frankly. I don't think anybody else that's shooting guns wants somebody next to them that doesn't want to be shooting their gun. But there's all kinds of ways to accomplish that. Civil service, 
the fucking Peace Corps, whatever the fuck, right? Mm -hmm. People need to get out of this country for a little bit or at least out of their own community and see what real suffering and poverty looks like before they start. Like all these kids where you're from in the Pacific Northwest, they're, they're running wild up there. These people have never faced any real challenges in their entire lives, ever. And all of a sudden, nope. they've developed fear of missing out on the oppression, and they're butthurt that they're not included in the fucking it group right now. They're, it, I, don't know if they're, I don't know if it's shame because they weren't oppressed or if it's just FOMO or what it is, but had those people at some point during their early life traveled more, left their area, seen what abject poverty and authoritarianism especially really looks like, mm-hmm. they wouldn't be calling Trump Hitler, for right. example, right. or they wouldn't have called Obama Hitler back in the day. These people are in rural areas. Right. Like he's not trying to be a king. I mean, he's kind of an asshole. Yeah. But give me a fucking break, dude. Any of these, I, I always wonder about that line of thinking. Uh, the people who respect and appreciate and fight for liberty most are the same people who would stop somebody like that from becoming a king. I don't give a fuck who it is in office. All the armed veterans in this country who traditionally lean more libertarian now, even the conservative, you really think they're going to let that shit happen? Like, what the fuck is wrong with you? Yeah. I, <laughs> one, it's not going to happen. This is goddamn Venezuela. Yeah. And, and to your point about missing out on things, like, um, I think when you hear stories like Ryan's, like, like your story today, right? There is some form of guilt that is going on with that generation of like, well, shit, that didn't happen. I, I had a happy childhood or I didn't do X, Y, and Z. And then they're, they're looking for some fake cause to go out and, and try to be a part of it so they can tell their kids some fucked up story one day of, of how they got, you know hit by a bottle at a, at a BLM event, and you're like... So there I was. Yeah, there I was, exactly. It, it's one of those stories. Um, but uh, for you in particular, to get this out to a lot of people, and especially to be this open and honest about it, I think this will help a lot of people. Um, as you were bringing this in to the finish line, um, what was it like holding the book in your hand for the first time? Because uh, we, we always say the same thing here. Of like, dude, when you get it, it will change your life, and you're like... Holy shit, it is an unbelievable sense of accomplishment that uh, is really undescribable. That's what my agent said to me after the first one. Was it the same way with you where you're just like, oh my God, I can't believe this is real? So it actually, yeah, uh, what had happened was I was in Afghanistan. I was supposed to be home for the release of the book, but COVID. And so we, we weren't able to leave. Well, I was actually, um, there was regular army unit there with us. And one thing that I forgot was how all these young 18 and 19 year old kids, they're very savvy on uh, social media and in uh, search and whatnot. So this guy came up to me and he goes, Hey, um, are you, uh, did you write a book? I was like, nah, nah, man. Uh, nah, it wasn't me. It was my brother, you know, just trying to, you know, cause I wasn't there for that reason. Right. Right. And, right. and then he, uh, it, it was, it was funny. Cause then he was like, um, are you, you sure? Cause isn't this you? <laughs> and I was like, and I, and I grabbed him. And I was like, come here, you little son of a bitch. I was like, where'd you get that? And he goes, we're all getting them. And I was like, holy crap. And I was like, well, can, can I touch it? <laughs> <laughs> and, yeah. And, and so, and, and so I'm sitting there, I was like, holy cow, this is mine. And yeah, that's, that, that's what happened. Cause I was trying to keep it under wraps. I wasn't there for that reason. Sure. And I just, I just forgot, like, these guys, they do their research, mm. and how they do it, Google. Wow, and, um, that's crazy, yeah. man. What a crazy story. Yeah. So you found out from someone else overseas. Somebody handed you your own book. Yeah, because I knew it was releasing, but I, I, I didn't think it was going to make it over there. And so I was just keeping it hush-hush, and I'll do my time, get home. And, and then, yeah, he's like, it's, it's funny, because this kind of looks like you. And I was like, <laughs> It's oh, the crap. it's the internet. You can't and, you can't hide yeah, anywhere. So then these days. you know, I was like, well, can I take some pictures with it and stuff? I just it was the coolest thing in the world. Yeah, yeah, that's <laughs> awesome. That's awesome. Look, I, I get to ask you the inevitable question that we ask everybody on the show. What about Pac-12 and how bad they suck? No, no, we'll get to that after <laughs> the sponsors, obviously. Sorry. But uh, we're gonna we're gonna ask you the same question we have every single author that comes on that uh, shares their life story with the world. Who do you want to play you in a movie? if Hollywood were to make a movie about your book in your life? <laughs> I've so, got one. Looking at you, I've got one. I think I would it's say David I, Boreanaz. Either Boreanaz or Pratt or uh, maybe Tom Hardy. They got the same build. Oh, uh, yeah. Tom Hardy would got be a good one. the same general build. Hardy loves doing vet shit, too. He's, he's a huge vet supporter. Yeah, who's your guy? Who do you want to play you in a movie? So 
my biggest issue is is my favorite actor. Uh, we, I mean, I don't. Is think he black? Is it Forrest Whitaker? Whitaker? Yeah, it's Forrest Whitaker. Yeah. <laughs> it's Washington. We don't oh. Same. Look anything alike. Same. I, look, it's he's he, he's one of the very best of all time. He's one of my favorites as well. Um, yeah, he's a, he's my fa- he's my favorite actor. And um, for people that don't know about him, he he came to Brooks Army Medical Center and donated well over a million dollars to the Fisher house and burn research and said, don't, I don't want anything to do with me. It's not about me. Yeah. And some asshole, some asshole took a picture and made a meme out of it, which I guess is good, but he didn't like, there's, there's a picture of him standing outside the Fisher house. You can find it pretty easily on the internet. Uh, he, he's given away millions and, and millions So the first time I heard about it was actually from Dan on this show. Yeah. He was the one who was talking about it. I was like, dude, in, yeah. in, out in Hollywood, I've never heard one fucking word about Denzel Washington giving Doing away charity, any yeah. money. Like, no. he's just not that dude, man. Like, he does it all the time, and nobody knows about it unless there's some crazy story about it where it's just like, oh, hey, man, Denzel Washington was here. And you're like, what? What was he doing there? Oh, he gave a bunch of money and then just left. And it was like, holy yep. shit. Same, so same thing yeah. happened there? Yep. At, yeah, at Brooks Army Medical Center. Yeah. Man. Yeah, he, he bought him a new uh, – well, there's no direct n- – neither side admits this, but here's what happened. They needed a new, like, uh, chow facility, like a dining facility or some shit like mm-hmm. that, and it was on the boards for a while and didn't happen, and then all of a sudden he shows up, and a couple months later a $1.5 million building, dollar building gets built. Now, it's yep. – you can say maybe he wrote a check, maybe he didn't, but, you know, a basic human intelligence tells you that he fucking – Somebody said, you know, we're just waiting for this new child. We can't afford it. He's like, oh, yeah, how much? Yeah. And he probably, he probably, probably wired just wrote the, the check. Yeah. yeah. Him, and, him, and, yep. him and Gary Sinise have given more to the veteran community than any human beings alive in America today. And it's not even close. Yeah. So they're, they're too, not that there aren't a lot of guys out there. Like, I mean, Boreanis is one of them. That whole cast or SEAL team are great. Yeah. Uh, but uh, a lot of people give a lot of money. But, man, just the amount of money total and then the that denzel's given and then the uh all the work publicly that gary sinise has done mm-hmm. is uh incredible yeah, yeah. I, it, it's it's phenomenal those guys um i heard it i heard a denzel washington story the other day about uh, chadwick boseman when chad boseman passed away um when he was in college apparently he got accepted uh, got accepted to the like the london school of arts like you know performing mm-hmm. like one of the greatest acting schools in america and didn't have the money for it and uh, one of the professors called denzel washington and 15 minutes later denzel had that that money wired over yeah and so Damn. later on down the road when chadwick boseman saw him at an award show he goes hey i just want to thank you like you're the reason i'm black panther i had no idea he yep. did any of that either and well i, was I mean like, he's he's one of those guys that always shows but one he gives back to to other actors but he also went back and pretty much funded all the boys and girls clubs where he grew up mm-hmm. and shit like that. Like that's, mm-hmm. it's always in New York. Been, yeah. Yeah. It's always yeah. been his style to do shit like that. I mean, we, we yeah, complain I'm, about fucking uh, celebrities so much. That I feel like when people do the right thing, people like Sorbo who does a lot for vets, yep. uh, uh, Denzel, Tom Hardy does a lot for vets. There's a lot of those guys. Chris Pratt does a lot for vets. There's a lot of those guys out there. You got to give them credit when credit's due. Otherwise it just seems like you're hating for the sake of hate. Uh, oh, for sure. Yeah. Absolutely. And look, I've, I've got to meet him a few times in real life and mm-hmm. hang out with him. He is a great yeah. guy. Um, it, like, there could not be a better guy and a, and a finer actor on this planet. So I get it. And to be honest, if, you, like, if anybody was going to do it, <laughs> look, if you're going to play a white guy, Denzel could probably pull it off. Yeah, he'd, he'd go white face. I think that's, <laughs> so, I think that's also, still fine. I've also heard, uh, because, like, basically, you can floss my teeth with a tugboat rope. They're like, well, what about Woody Harrelson? I was like, oh my god! <laughs> if he was younger, a younger they, Woody, you know, they, yeah. they, they made him look. They made him look pretty young on uh, on True Detective, that first season of True Detective. Yeah, I mean, he looked like he was in his mid thirties, and he's yeah. not. No, he's definitely not. No. There's, a, there's a lot of tread on. But that it could tire. it could be all the weed keeping him young too. You don't know. Who knows? Who knows? But uh, that's funny, man. Um, yeah, I, I, I think Boreanaz would be a good Like, looking at you, I think Boreanaz would be a yeah, good one. he'd be a good one. Uh, he'd be great. He's, oh, he's, yeah. He knows all – well, he, you, he'd have to learn uh, – to he'd have to unlearn all the SEAL shit and learn, you know, SFTTPs and shit, but I think he'd be able to handle it, right? Yeah, he's fine. Come on. <laughs> he's fine. You'll, you'll, yeah. you'll be his uh, on-set tech advisor, so you're good. <laughs> you're, you're good with that. Um, look, you listen to the show. Uh, we got some sponsors who put this uh, show on the air. And then I want to ask you about uh, what you're doing now today and how you're, 
you're going through uh, uh, navigating post-military and COVID and all that stuff. Uh, first and foremost is ghostbed.com forward slash drinking bros. If you're a member of the military, like uh, Mr. Hendrickson, a first responder, a teacher, or work in the government, you get 30% off. If you're a regular uh, October surprise type of dude like myself here, you get 30% off of bundle packages um, at ghostbed.com forward slash drinking bros. And as always, they've got the 36 month uh, pay as you go program. No interest there at ghostbed.com forward slash drinking bros. Finest mattresses. Pillows, sheets in the biz. Who do we got up next, Anthony? What day is today? Today is Wednesday. This is the day that the Lord have made. Ah. I think you're in the same boat, Ryan, where it's like every day feels the same. Are you in the COVID boat where it's just like, what day is this every day? Uh, not so much in Florida. They're they're kind of they, they've kind of done away with you know all the COVID you know precautionary. That's right. Measures you guys have been partying for this entire time. Well, look, time. I mean, what what chance does COVID have <laughs> against uh, crystal meth and bath salts? And, Let's and be real. Gators. And gators. Oh man. yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's no fucking way. <laughs> oh yeah. Come on. Definitely. But uh, yeah, it's been I, I don't know. It's been weird. I, I you know I got home yeah. in um, in August from Afghanistan and uh, I may be heading back early December this year. So well. We'll see. It all de- it all depends. I mean, there I, there's rumors going around everywhere about time frame of shutdown and stuff like that. So I'm I'm definitely just waiting to see. But then um, finish up this trip and kind of maybe focus more on the book or whatnot. Yeah. Mm. Well, look if you're uh, if you need to be clean, you can go to DukeCannon.com yep. <laughs> and get some soap. The Naval Supremacy is the jam over there. The old glory. My and uh, they got a bunch of colognes now that is promo code Drinking Bros 10 yep. at uh, DukeCannon.com. Uh, they give back uh, a lot to veteran charities at the end of, yep. of uh, every single year. And they're the <laughs> finest soap in the land. That is requested by you guys. Um, and uh, we were lucky enough that they signed on to do mm. it. Uh, love DukeCannon.com. Promo code Drinking Bros 10. Are you married? Yes. You are? You got any kids and, and all that stuff? Uh, no, no kids that, uh, that kind of went out the drain September 12th, 2010. <laughs> really? Yeah. And, and do they, do you know that on the day? Like, do they say, Hey man, you're not going to have kids anymore. You don't have a chance to have children or. No, I, um, it, I, I didn't really know until, uh, Brooks army medical center. And, you know, I kept doing all the tests and everything like that. And they're just like, yeah, it's just too much damage. It's, it's funny. You never really step on an IED with your legs closed. It kind of, <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah. Hindsight 2020, I would have probably like put my hand there or something. I don't know. But, <laughs> but the, but your penis still works, right? Oh yeah. There oh, yeah. you go. There you go. All right. Well, <laughs> look, you can actually, uh, you can just get a crisper baby made at this point. Yeah. You ever think about a crisper? It's it's like it's not like IVF, so it's not a process where you uh, use your DNA to get somebody pregnant. You can make a baby in a lab with your DNA. Actually, two men now can make a baby together. Yeah, because they have There's a pregnant X, man on Oprah. Because they have X and Y. No, yep. no, no, I'm not talking about getting a guy pregnant. I'm saying their their DNA no. can be spliced together to make a fucking child. I'm saying this. I think we get him pregnant, um, and then chat with your wife about it. Maybe you switch sides, and then we put some eggs up inside you, and then see him get pregnant. Yeah, we could do that. You know why not? <laughs> I mean, well, I think uh, I think we're just going to adopt. I think that's the, that's the route. <laughs> are, are you going to adopt? Is that something on the table for you and your lady? Yeah. Yeah. We're uh, once. Yeah. I'm going to do this next deployment. And then uh, I think we're going to open up our home. Mm, that's and, good. Uh, go, that's go awesome. That route, so. Well, the good thing about yep. adoption is if the kid doesn't work out, you can always, you know, trade it in for a new. Is that how is I that, I, I'm I not sure how that works. Is that it, it might it might be how it works. Yeah, can I you, have no idea. Can you put them? Can you put them on layaway or something? <laughs> yeah, do you get to do you get to uh, have like an adoption draft where you get to line them up, test Ooh, out their forty times, yeah, and because yeah. uh, like you want to do it like press. you want to do Sandra Bullock blindside. You don't want to get some fucking scrub. You want a kid that's got a future in the league in the NFL. Yeah, yeah. in the NFL. Did you play sports in high school? You look like a big guy. Yeah, yeah, I wrestled and played football. Okay, there you go. So yeah, that's my only look because uh, you don't know, and that's look. That's the advantage you have over me. I have two kids, right? <laughs> But you don't know what they're going to turn out to be like. I'm I'm six three and a half. My wife is five two. Our first child looks like he's going to be shorter, like mm. probably probably a five eighter, right? But the next one's going to be Gronk. He is a gigantic baby with huge hands, and I know he might have a shot at it. So what I'm telling you is this: if you were to have real kids on your own, you don't really get to choose. 
Now you mm-hmm. get to choose at the adoption place, and I'd line them up, see who's fastest, uh, and start going through their skills. Maybe some uh, flashcards, things like that. Um, make really him, find the <laughs> smartest, most, most athletic one that make, can take care of you later. Make them take the Wonderlic test and run the 40. Yeah, that's what I'm saying, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That way they're Why taking not? care of you, so you're not just adopting, <laughs> which is great for the world. But you're also picking out a retirement package. Yeah, you got to do both. There's no reason not to do both. No, like, not at all. I feel like you buy yourself a little leniency with the whole selection process, <laughs> just with the fact that you decided to go select someone in the first place, right? Yes, dude. Like, just give me what I want. I came here to shop for what I want. <laughs> Don't make me feel bad about it. Get this kid on the treadmill. Let's go. So let's go, boy or girl. Is that has that been a conversation yet? Um, it it, it has not not yet. We're um, still trying to kind of wrap our minds around everything that's going on. So yeah, yeah, we, uh, it's a lot. We tried the in vitro thing, and it, it it just they said it's not. You know, we tried all the shots, everything like that, and they're just like it. It's just not going to work, guys. Yeah. So, um, so now we're moving on to the adoption thing, and and so yeah, actually this month I go in to do my physical to make sure you know I'm not going to have a heart attack after adopting a a new um, newborn, and mm-hmm. you know I I I croak or some shit like that, and we'll be doing a home inspection here coming up and, and all kinds of stuff. So yeah, it's, uh, it's exciting, but I'm, I'm a little nervous about mm. the, uh, the price tag and everything oh, yeah. like that. It's, it's crazy. <clears throat> if you got a, it's crazy how crackheads can pop out 18 kids, but you know, someone that has a good home and a, and they can give a good life. I mean, there's, there's price tags. I've heard up 30, 40, $50,000. Holy like, shit. Yeah. yeah. Cause I know, look, I, IBF is not expensive. Um, not inexpensive, you mean? Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah, um, I think it's Derek, exp- I think it's like 15 grand, right? No, Derek spent 25 on his, and that's not including the ancillary fees, which I think drove it up somewhere closer to 40. Oh, yeah. god damn! Did you have to pay that and then it not work? Do you get your money back? What happens in a situation like that? No. So with me, um, because of the of the trauma, the V, uh, I think the VA. Mm-hmm. Well, it was anyways one one of those because it was a combat related um, issue it was actually paid for but with that there's there's a lot of um, stipulations to it and and basically it was it was almost like a one shot and you know but I'm glad I'm glad that I got the the hard answer of like it's not going to happen instead of us hanging on and and hoping and hoping and hoping so I I actually you know I really commend the doctor for that like hey dude like it's it's not the route you want to go. Yeah, that's, that's cool because it, it also saves your wife as well because those shots are not uh, easy. Uh, those Ooh. are painful. Yeah, I think fucking uh, Derek White has yeah. been on. I think know, his wife was taking like nine in. shots um, a day yeah, on some days. Yeah, something some awful, like, yeah. man. Fuck and that. then you have to time yeah. up like yeah, when you guys uh, have sex, there's like a, an app or something. Yeah, there was all kinds of stuff that we had to do. It was yeah, it was it, it was pretty crazy, and then just just the amount of hormones and everything like that. But um, it was mine. They actually had to. Um, I'd have to go to the. Uh, I, I don't know the doctor's office, beat off in a cup and whatnot mm. like that, and because and then they would use that to try and I guess put it in the egg or yeah yeah or yeah, yeah. So, something something like that. But yeah, I remember being in in the little room and this guy walks out and she's like, all right, you're up. And it's this little closet like room. And I'm like, this dude was just in here fucking going to pound town on himself. (laughs) Yeah. Did you ever ask for any weird material? I would ask for the weirdest shit. I'm like, do you, you, like, I don't need any magazines or videos. Can you just bring me some stockings? And then they bring me in like, like, yeah. Like tight stockings? Like, no, yeah, like, yeah. no, I mean like Christmas stockings. Christmas stockings. I need exactly. Christmas stockings. I need three of them hung on the wall, and I need you guys to stay in here and face away. And I me. need you to put names on all of them, and I want Jimmy, Timmy, Teddy on those, on those three stockings, yeah. and that's the only way I can get off. Yeah, and then there's, Mine then there's, another, porn, there's yeah. another smaller stocking at the end. There's a nail for it, but mm-hmm. no stocking, so you know one of the kids is gone. Yeah. Right? <laughs> that's, it's part of my fantasy. I don't, don't fucking kink shame me. I yeah. do what I want. Tell the doctor to dress up as Santa. Yeah, um, Just, yeah that's a strange thing. <laughs> You go into these rooms and it's like 10,000 other dudes have jacked off in the same room and it's like, have fun. Oh, yeah. I mean, that's every, oh, yeah. that's every hotel yeah, I've no. ever been in, though. Let's be real. That's true. That's very true. Pound off in a hotel that, at least five that's times. That's a very good point. <laughs> yeah. Do, do you get to bring your wife in there? No. No, there's, yeah, you can't, uh, no lotion, nothing. It's got to be, got to be straight up dry. It's, it, it's kind of like a, it's 
it's kind of like a pre-mission beat session. Like mm. you're all amped up. You need to calm down, run to the porta yeah. potty real quick, knock it out of the park, and then, you know, head head to the vehicles and get ready to roll. But um, it's kind of kind of what it is. But yeah, I I walked in there. I was like, I'm not touching anything. There's, yeah, there's I wouldn't a baby batter all over this place. Yeah, yeah. I wouldn't either. I'd, for sure. Uh, that's crazy. A wheelchair porn I'd probably ask for. Well, luckily it's COVID times right now, so they probably at least cleaned up the room a little bit better. Yeah, they had to. Yeah, right? they had I, to. Yeah. If I if I ever end up in a room like that, I'm definitely bringing a UV light. Yeah, yeah, yeah. To, and just keep all the lights <laughs> yeah. off and then look all yeah. around. Yeah. I would. Yeah. I would not. I would not do that. <laughs> <laughs> I would uh, just ride the lightning. <laughs> Why, why is adoption so expensive? Serious question. Like, I, I did not know there was any cost involved in adoption. And maybe I'm naive yeah, for that, I, but. I, yeah, it's, I, I don't know why. I, I really, I have no idea. But when, when, when you, so. like, when you, I guess, not, it's not probably not a brochure, but when you get a, the application or whatever it is, what is the cause for the fees? Like, what, you know? Like, that doesn't make any sense to me. To me, if you're willing to adopt, Jesus Christ, mm. man! They they should they should jump through hoops to you know make it free. Like, what's the cost involved? Yeah, that's so. My mindset was the same as yours. Um, the only cost that I know of right now is so um, when you're doing all the paperwork, that's you know five hundred dollars, and then you have the home visit fee and and stuff like that. But we haven't even touched adoption fees yet, and mm. yeah, it's um, I I don't know. I've I've heard. Like I had a buddy and he adopted a kid and I know, uh, you know, it, it got pricey cause he adopted a kid from, from uh, South Korea, but yeah, yeah it was like $45,000. Um, but well, that flight's yeah, not, that flight's not cheap. So that one, I understand. He probably wanted the kid in first as well. And it's yeah. like, dude, you're looking at 18 K. And that's that a good first. investment. Cause he's probably going to create the new iPhone. In yes, your basement, dude. So. Uh, like if you're going to buy someone, buy an Asian. Yeah. Don't, yeah, don't definitely, don't, <laughs> definitely don't go overseas to get a white kid scholarship. Guess who's not paying for college. You sure. are. Yeah. Cause you got an Asian. Um, mm -hmm. I, and I understand <laughs> that your buddy made the right call on that one, but, uh, yeah, yeah that, that's, that's really shitty, man. I, I, Strangely, out of like the 1,500 shows I've done, I, I don't think I've ever had anybody on who's gone through the process of adoption. So I didn't, I didn't know there was any cost to, like, associated with that. Mm. Uh, that's really shitty, man. Um, are you going to keep uh, like an American child? Yeah. Oh, yeah. We're, do we're, we're adopting here. Um, it's just, yeah, we, we're going to go through the whole process and, and, and kind of see basically uh, how, how the cards fall. I mean... Awesome. And, yeah. Awesome, man. Awesome. Well, look, this is the point in the show where we get to the drinking bro of the week, which is uh, someone who has inspired you or helped you become the person you are today. Who would you like to give the drinking bro of the week to? Um, well, as you guys will see in my book, my dad, you know, with, just with the advice, because, uh, you know, from, from some pretty dark days in the hospital there, I, I can... I definitely can see how people end up as part of the 22 a day. Mm. I really do. And, um, and so having that family backing to, to keep your head straight and well, as straight as it can be when you're, when you're cranked off of methadone and whatnot, but, um, and just, just, just keep everything in perspective in reality. Yeah. Um, you, you'll see in the book, it's just, you know, my dad, you know, he's, that's that's got to be it for me. So uh, it's a, it's a great one. We have, we have a lot of people actually give it to their fathers, mm. and uh, uh, there's nothing wrong with that at all. Um, look, man, you're you're an inspiring guy, and mm -hmm. it's it's amazing what you've gone through. Uh, check out his book, Tip of the Spear. Um, for those of, you, uh, of uh, our audience who uh, the listeners who are going to buy this book, what was your favorite chapter in that? Um, <clears throat> I'd I'd have to say running around uh southeast asia and uh about getting arrested in ho chi minh city uh oh there it is um, that's a good one there yeah. it is <laughs> how many prostitutes so, were involved yeah <laughs> and strangely enough that's uh yeah you you can really get yourself in a bad situation in vietnam for doing that so <laughs> Um, yeah, but, uh, there was some, there was some money owed to a hotel and I, I didn't have the money. I was broke cause I flew to Vietnam for a week and a half with about $500 to my name, <laughs> ran out of money. And so the military or well, I would say cops, but 
soldiers came in and I had an AK-47 in my chest and I was like, oh, this is, this is probably pretty bad. Mm. I've seen Locked Up Abroad. I can't imagine Locked Up Abroad, you know, Saigon, but this, <laughs> this will probably be on there somewhere. Holy and, shit. Uh, called the embassy and they were like, hey, man, pay your bills. Yeah, what are like, you doing? Well, shit, I didn't, you know, I got scammed is what happened. Uh, okay. And, uh, and there was a couple, uh, couple uh, uh, girls from Ireland that were walking by and they were like, hey, is, is everything okay? And I, I explained it to them. They paid, they paid the $350 that, you know, was charged to my room that had nothing to do with me. And then when I got home and I got paid, um, I, I Western Union them uh, 700 bucks uh, to make up for it. So. No shit. Uh, yeah. obviously the next follow up question is going to be, were they hot? Like were the, were the, were the Irish chicks <laughs> so, hot and were they down to party? So, um, good looking. I wouldn't say hot and down to party. No. Okay. So, <laughs> so they just did it out of the goodness of their hearts. Not because yep. they had like, you know, the American soldier fantasy of like, Hey, uh, we just no. saved his life. Maybe he can save ours tonight. No, no, it's no, that it, it didn't quite happen that way. So. <laughs> now, if it ever happens again, I would recommend playing Hulk Hogan's theme song. Uh, I am a real American. Yeah, I'm a real American. Yeah. Just to, even if it doesn't work out, at least you're flexing. You know what I mean? Yeah. Which is really important. We don't want <laughs> Ireland is a is a beautiful country, but they're dumb and poor, right? I, my family comes from there. I know exactly. Are they? What. I dude, I've never. I know nothing about their economy's Ireland. fucked. Is it really? They almost died. They're on an island uh -huh. surrounded by fish. They almost died because potatoes ran out. Let's be fucking real about what Ireland is. Exactly. <laughs> okay. I have no delusions myself. I, I mean, it's a beautiful country, and my ancestors hail from there. But come on, man. I know very. I know Conor McGregor. Um, I know Lucky Charms. And, uh, <laughs> I, don't think and I know it was probably next to where Braveheart was shot, like somewhere in there, you know, a uh, different Island. Yeah. But still, well, actually, I don't pro know. Probably the same. I don't you know, know where Braveheart was shot. I don't either, but, uh, it's what I imagine Ireland to look like. So that's, that's my best guess, uh, thing there. Was that, was that a whole deal? Like when you got off was to go to Vietnam, did they like, did everybody party there? No. Um, I, I went to Vietnam just, just cause I wanted to go to some areas that my dad was, you know, stationed at mm. and a couple of the areas I went to, they were just overgrown jungle. And, and, uh, the guys with, he's like, yeah, it used to be a, used to be a base right there and there. And then I went to this place, um, in Vong Tau and, uh, the base that used to be an American base, it was now a, you know, Vietnamese army base. And so mm. I thought that was pretty cool. Learned a lesson. Don't take pictures of the base because <laughs> you'll get rolled up there too. And I was like, well, shit, man, I just can't win in Vietnam. But to, we to didn't either, day, though, to be honest. So, <laughs> <Yeah>. you know, <laughs> <laughs> to this day, though, that's my that's my favorite country I've ever been to. Really, that's it. what everybody says. And South I'm, Vietnam and South Korea are two of the like most technologically advanced, safe countries on earth right now. That's like funny. Korea. So, my my parents went there and they said they enjoyed it, and then I was like, really, Vietnam? And then I remember <laughs> when uh, Anthony Bourdain did his special with. Uh, President Obama, he took him over there to Vietnam, and I guess the the food is phenomenal, and uh, and the culture is amazing. Yeah, I, like yeah. lights out, and everybody says the same thing. Um, and I'm always surprised when I'm like, really, you want to go to Vietnam? But it's that, it's that great, huh? Yeah, I I want to go back, and I'm gonna I'm gonna ride motorcycles from uh, Ho Chi Minh City up to Hanoi, all along the coastal Highway One. And uh, just hit every single beach town on the way up there, and just yeah, man, it's it, it's badass. So my one recommendation is to do that before you get that kid, because after the child arrives, you will have zero life, and you won't be able to do anything. Yeah, and so. once you get up next to Hanoi, make sure you look on for the uh, billboards of uh, Jane Fonda they have up there still. Do they really? No. <laughs> 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 no, but she can get fucked though. Yeah, yeah. Well, Jane yeah, Fonda can always. Everybody's get fucked. always like, she was young, man. She was thirty fucking three years old when that happened. Yeah. By the way, yeah, she was. If you haven't grown figured up. it out by then. Maybe you're not going to. I can't remember Jane Fonda ever being young. Like she, it seems like she's always eternally been thirty-five to sixty. You know. Yeah. Um, <laughs> not bad looking, just uh, you know, weird lady. Definitely a weird lady. Uh, weird lady. Um, who else is in the book that you could see playing uh, in a movie? By the way. Who else is in the book that I could see playing in a movie? Yeah, did you think about that when you were writing it all? Like the other? Uh, I mean, oh, I wasn't thinking about anything movie at all. At all. No but, shit. Typically, everybody does. Yeah. That's that's usually the first thought of like, hey, dude, 
If I was going to make this into a movie, this is who I would have mm-hmm. in it. No, I, I mean, yeah, I've been, you know, I've, I've been asked that question a couple times and, and for me, I, I don't know, I was thinking like Chris Pratt or something like that, but I've always had a shaved head. And so it's kind of like, well, not, not just it's... you, but other people like the doctor, like, would you get Clooney to play the doctor and try to get him back in the ER days? I like, get, I get Doogie Howser. Oh, that'd be great. But NBA as age? a 16 year old. Yes. <laughs> and like, age him down. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And he does the leg surgery. What we're trying to do is we're trying to make this become a, a global blockbuster yeah. here. So the notes we're giving should absolutely be taken. I think NPH, as the, as the child doctor, would probably, be great. probably wouldn't take any of this advice. <laughs> but, you know, if you do, it'll probably work out. Everything seems to work out for us. So <laughs> no matter how stupid, like we come up with these ideas, and it's like, this is fucking stupid. Then we do it, and it like blows up. We're like, God damn it. I know. It's almost embarrassing sometimes. I know. Uh, Clooney's producing uh, Clint's movie. Is he really? Yeah, Clint's. Uh, oh, that's right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Romaché. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, he's, that's the production company behind it. But I know there was another one with Jake Tapper that they released. Um, Jake Tapper wrote the fucking movie and sold it on Clint's story and uh, unauthorized, and that is out there right now. Yeah. Yeah. Crazy, right? No. Jake, <laughs> I, Jake Tapper's a cunt, so no, it's not. <laughs> uh, last but not least here, before you, we, we let you go, uh, you got any election predictions here? Election predictions? Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, I don't think I'm predicting anything. I'm, I'm, I'm fairly certain that, you know, it's going to be um, four more years, but... Um, I just, you know, there's, there, there's a lot of hype going on right now. And I, I, under, I understand that, but I mean, I, I think there has to be hype or else the news, the mm. news wouldn't sell and there'd be no yeah. ratings or nothing like that. I, I just, yeah, that, I that, just don't, that, that's why I don't I'm, see. I don't either. And that's why we ask is, uh, cause this show, a lot of people don't know this, like we record and then it's out pretty much immediately. So the right. show will be out, you know, in, in like two hours. But, um, mm-hmm. uh, that is the, I guess the topic on everybody's, uh, mind here mm-hmm. is, uh, what's going to happen in this, uh, this election. It's weird, man. I, cause we believe the same thing, but, uh, again, looking at the, the polls today, I was like, Nope, 91% Biden's favored to win. And I'm like, in what world? I've doubled down in my bookie, by the way. Hmm. Um, on I mean, this, you can bet on the president. Yeah. So uh, I have doubled down. Um, look, we hey, we appreciate you being on the show today. You're endlessly fascinating. Uh, please go check out the book, Tip of the Spear. Uh, it's available on Amazon. Uh, is it in bookstores and all that stuff? Yeah, it's in bookstores, and I also um, I'm I'm a I'm a pretty good or I'm a pretty big idiot, but I actually I got a website too. So. Oh, great. <laughs> Go ahead yeah, and plug it. Uh, yeah, it's RyanMHendrickson.com. So it's, um, I didn't build it. It was built for me, but yeah. Let me ask you this. Can people buy signed copies off of that website? So I'm still working on, on that whole deal. What mm-hmm. I've been doing with signed copies is I basically, if someone wanted a signed copy, they'd, they'd hit me up on usually Instagram, mm. um, which is, you know, it's at uh, tip of the spear RMH. Um, okay but they'd hit me up on Instagram and we just, we'd exchange information, uh, mailing information. I just, um, sign a book, write a little something and, and have it, have it in the mail within a couple days. So perfect. Uh, look, you heard it here first. Yeah. Hit him up on Instagram. He will sign your book and send it back. It's Thank all, you for it's your also time. It's also on today. audible by the way. Yeah. It's also, did you read your yeah. audible? Yeah, it's, yeah, it's not, no, I did not. I was in Afghanistan when it came out. Mm. So I was I was surprised that uh, it was on Audible, <laughs> and so. But apparently, the guy who did it, um, he, yeah, he he knocked it out of the park. Everyone said he did amazing. So that's great. That's, that's great. Cause usually, you don't know when when the when the publisher chooses for you, it could go the other way, where it's just right. like, you know, it's a British guy yeah. or something like that. But uh, <laughs> that would be cool. But uh. <laughs> <laughs> not for your life story, though. Shit, uh, yeah. I'm, I'm glad it turned out all right. That's shocking, though. You're over in Afghanistan. You could probably listen. Did you listen to your book on on audio when you were over there? No, I I, I couldn't do it. So it just just out of like uh, you couldn't hear the story or. No, I just um, I, I I started listening to it. I bought the book and I started listening to it, and I was just like, man, I just. I don't want to listen to my own story so. right? because <laughs> wow. I had gone through that book page by page, sentence by sentence, 
pretty much word by word yeah so yeah, many bet. times through the editing and the and the and the review process and everything i was just kind of sick of it to tell you the truth no i get it man i'm all these books i'm sick of like at the end of it and you're like man is this any good or people are just gonna fucking shit on it uh yeah you get tired of it um but we aren't tired of you man i look i again I can't thank you enough for being here mm -hmm. today you you were a, a guest that was has been requested for a long time and uh thanks for taking the time out of your day man i, I appreciate you guys having me on here everyone talks about you guys so to be on here this is it's a huge deal. Huge deal. Uh, so. it's, look, it's a huge deal for us, so we greatly appreciate yep. it. Uh, for D'Anthony, D'Anthony Holloway, I am Ross Patterson. Go buy Tip of the Spear today uh, and check out this man's story. Good night, everyone.